reaction collapse of the, of the banking system. Now, as we're moving in that direction, a grouping in the city of London, a grouping of, of financial elites, has decided they're going to pull the plug. And so the same people who were the advocates of this hyperinflationary bailout policy are now saying that they're going to pull the plug, wipe out all the debt, wipe out people's savings, people's pensions, wipe out the value of your dollar-based retirement funds, and set up a new financial system. Now, many times in the past, people have talked about the New World Order, the Amero, the, um, you know, what would be the currency of this New World Order, and a lot of times they were dismissed as conspiracy nuts and wackos and so on. Well, and, and some of them are. Some of them are doing that to scare you and to get you to buy gold or something else. But I'll tell you right now that what we're looking at, what Mr. LaRouche exposed in his webcast last Friday night, and you can go on the LaRouchePack.com website to hear this, what we exposed is the fact that this gang of crooks and criminals and swindlers is preparing to pull the plug the same way they did in October 1987. You remember that stock market crash? the same way they did with the Asian markets in 1998, where Soros pulled the plug on that. In 1999, the Russian bond market under long-term capital management. 2000, 2001, the dot-com bubble blew up. 2006 and 7, the housing bubble blew up. Each time they have a speculative run, they move in and grab all the resources and loot they can. And each time, they've gone ahead and started a new bubble. Well, this time, they're not going to start a new bubble. They're going to pop the bubble, and then they're going to go for a new financial system. And that's where we stand. And so we're going to be talking in the rest of the program today about this war danger that comes from the Obama administration functioning as a puppet of the British Empire. I have some updates for you from Russia from what the Russians are saying, what the Russians are doing, uh, including the Russians re-offering uh, to the United States a collaboration for addressing the problem of near-Earth orbit objects, like the asteroid that just went by the Earth last Friday. And the same day, a devastating meteor strike in uh, Siberia. Uh, these kinds of problems, there are millions of meteors out there, uh, many of which may be on a collision course to the Earth, and we don't have the, the resources at present allocated to make sure we can protect ourselves from that. So the Russians have made another offer to the United States, very similar to the one that Lyndon LaRouche drafted for Ronald Reagan in 1983 that the United States made to Russia to develop anti-missile defense systems. The Russians are saying, now let's use these new physical principles that Reagan was talking about, that LaRouche drafted for Reagan back in 83. Let's use these new physical principles to form a protective shield of the Earth against objects such as meteors, asteroids, comets, and so on. So this is where we could be going through collaboration with the Russians instead of on a crash course toward war as Tony Blair is, is moving to, to expand the fighting in Syria, in Iraq, with Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Egypt, uh, on into North Africa, and eventually these terrorists are going to target Europe and the United States. So either we break with that policy, that Anglo-Saudi terror policy, which is a dagger aimed at Russia, but which is actually the flip side of it is it's a dagger aimed at us. Either we continue down that course toward war with Obama, or we get him out and we go toward a collaborative effort to develop these new capabilities, new physical principles. And that's where we are. So we'll, we'll be talking about that and then the economy when we come back in just a minute after these messages. Okay, we're back on the Dr. Deagle Show, the Nutramedical Report. Um, for those of you who didn't hear the first part, this is 
Harley Schlanger. I'm usually the guest in the first hour on uh, Wednesday afternoon uh, where Dr. Deagle and I have a discussion. Uh, today I, I was informed too late to get someone else on with me, so you're just stuck with me today. I'll be doing the uh, uh, discussion, and I'm going to try to bring you some some provocative thoughts and uh, take you through the hour. So let me start where I left off. We were talking about the, the potential to break out of the war danger. I want to just start by making a point uh, that just hits right at what the problem is, why we face a war danger. The, this goes back to the collapse of the European financial system and the U.S. financial system. Forget all this talk about recovery, about the uh, slow but steady recovery. We are literally on a, a purge to go to, to, to lose the whole financial system, to lose the monetary system. The dollar would blow out. Uh, we've already uh, put ourselves in debt that's, that's unrecoverable. And each day, you, you, you talk about the $16 trillion national debt. Well, there's another two to three times that large amount in Federal Reserve obligations that include money that was sneaked into the TARP bill, the TALF bill, uh, its guarantees, loan guarantees, and, and things of that sort. The financial system is finished, and I'll come back to this in the second half hour where I'll talk mostly about the economy. This is the driver for a war danger. In the same way World War II came out of the Depression uh, and attempts by the British imperial system to use the Germans to attack the Soviet Union and have the Germans and the Russians destroy each other. The same way World War I had a lot to do with the problems that the British had in sustaining their global sea empire. Uh, with the emergence of rail systems in, in Russia, in Europe, the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad, all of these threaten, threaten completely the British control of uh, commercial sea lanes. And so oftentimes it's the economy that is the impetus for war. And we've seen this in the United States. We've, we've seen this in the, the Bush period. The Bush administration was heading toward a catastrophe, and then 9-11 occurred. This was a predictable event. Uh, we've had a series of, of uh, uh, efforts to try to come up with solutions to the financial system, but there's no solution. They have no alternative. And so what we're dealing with is a situation which is out of control. Now, under these circumstances, there's always a search for more loot. Is there some other place in the world that money can come from? Is there some other bailout source? And within the last five years, there's been a hope among the financial elite of Wall Street and the city of London that they could convince the Russians and the Chinese to join with the rest of the transatlantic system in the bailouts of the bankrupt financial system. Now, Russia has money because of its oil, its oil reserves. Uh, China has money because they're selling us goods. So you had two countries. China has well over a trillion dollars already of U.S. Federal Reserve notes. I mean, not Federal Reserve notes, but Treasury bills. Uh, China has been the largest or second largest purchaser of Treasury bills in, in the last decade. Uh, and the Russians, of course, have gold they've got raw materials, and they've got cash. And so the effort was made to bring the Russians and the Chinese into this financial system. Now, the Russians and the Chinese are not stupid. You may not like them. You may think, well, the Chinese are a bunch of sneaky communists. Uh, the Russians, we just don't understand them. I mean, I will tell you, Russia has been our strongest ally for most of our history. Uh, if you go back to the Revolutionary War, if you go back to the Civil War, but the Russians are unwilling to put their money, put their wealth into a bailout fund to bail out derivative obligations, mortgage-backed securities, bankrupt rental properties. Uh, as uh, Putin said, why should we eat your spoiled food? It will just give us indigestion. And so there had been some hope that when Putin left, 
left and Medvedev came in, that Medvedev could be convinced to put the Russian money into the Eurozone and into U.S. banks and to liberalize the Russian banking system. Similarly, there were hopes that China would open up its banking system. Now, neither country has leaders that are that stupid. They will not risk the future of their nation. They don't want to turn their nation into a Greece or an Italy or a Spain. They are committed to the idea of being sovereign nations, a concept that we should know as Americans because we actually became the strongest, most powerful sovereign republic on the planet by acting as a sovereign nation, taking responsibility for our own financial policy, our own economic policy. So the Russians and the Chinese are looking at the West, they're seeing this collapse, and they wanted nothing to do with it. So it was at that point that the decision was made to escalate uh, the wars, including the Iraq and Afghanistan war, and to target Iran and Syria, which were both allies of uh, Russia and China. And the first target, of course, was Gaddafi. That was the test run. You know, it's hard to, to offer a defense of Muammar Gaddafi. So when Obama and the British and the French said, we're going to go in and help the freedom-loving Libyans overthrow their dictator, the Congress allowed them to do it. They allowed Obama to commit the United States to boots on the ground and money to fund the operation, including the no-fly zone, the shooting down of the Libyan planes, and so forth. That was allowed, even though it violated the U.S. Constitution. And then when Gaddafi was killed, this was a test run for Syria. And now we're seeing the same thing play out in Syria. And don't fool yourselves. The Russians know that this is not about Hafez al-Assad and his son Bashir al-Assad. This is about Russia. This is about Putin. This is about those like Michael McFaul, the U.S. ambassador to Russia, John McCain, and others who are saying that there will be a Moscow spring. Now, after we saw what the Arab spring became, do we really want to see a Moscow spring? So this is where the war danger comes from. It grew out of the financial collapse. And Obama, as a loyal servant of these Wall Street and City of London financial interests, is making sure that he's doing everything possible to break the resistance in Russia and China to giving up their sovereignty. And the Russians and the Chinese are saying they will not do it. They will stand against this. Now, at the same time, Obama is extending the U.S. engagement against Russia into Eastern Europe and against China and the Asia and Pacific. So we'll pick that up when we come back after the break. Uh, this is Harley Schlanger for the Dr. Eagle Show, and we'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to the Bill Deagle Show. This is Harley Schlanger. I'm sitting in for Dr. Deagle today, and uh, I'm going to take you through the rest of the hour. Uh, we've been talking about, up to this point, the war danger and why it is that President Obama has carried out a policy which is essentially putting the United States on the side of the Anglo-Saudi pro-terror apparatus that funds and deploys al-Qaeda. Now, if you want to get more on this, you can go to our website, LaRouchePak.com, and we have a fact sheet. Uh, it's called an updated fact sheet, which goes through the fact that the U.S. government, including the president, including his national security advisor, Clapper, including Brennan, his special assistant, who's now the nominee to head up the CIA, that they knew we were providing arms to al-Qaeda terrorists in Libya, and they're trying to get arms to al-Qaeda terrorists in Syria. They're actually doing it through Saudi Arabia and Qatar. So this is one side of the story. But I want to give you the other side, what, what Lyndon LaRouche talked about last Friday night on his uh, webcast. And that's also available. I'd urge you to listen to at least the first ten minutes where he lays out the danger. As I said earlier, the danger is that as we've gone into a hyperinflationary bubble with the uh, 
derivative obligations, the credit default swaps, and so on, growing exponentially, while the physical economy, the means of production to produce wealth covered to cover the debt, has been shrinking. Now, this is something that Mr. LaRouche has been talking about for years. But as of the last three or four weeks, we're beginning to see other people saying, coming around to see what Mr. LaRouche was saying. Let me read you some quotes from a man named William Gross, Bill Gross, who's the founder of the top bond trading firm in the world, PIMCO. Uh, he had an article titled Credit Supernova, and he described the current global financial system to a supernova. He says, each additional dollar of credit seems to create less and less heat. In the 1980s, now here's the important thing. I want you to think about this, maybe even write it down, because this is critical to know. This is coming from a guy who makes his living trying to figure out how to squeeze a few pennies margin through bond sales. He writes that in the 1980s, it took $4 of new credit to generate $1 of real GDP. He said over the last decade, it has taken $10 of credit to generate $1 of real GDP. But since 2006, that's when the housing bubble popped, $20 in new credit to produce a dollar of GDP. And Gross wrote, this is a monster that requires perpetually increasing amounts of fuel, a supernova star that expands and expands, yet in the process begins to consume itself. Now, I'm going to tell you that Gross is only partially right. He's greatly underestimated by an order of magnitude how bad the situation is. Now, he admits that all he's counting in his credit to GDP uh, is credit that comes, or debt that's U.S. government debt, corporate debt, and household debt. But he's not yep. counting what he calls shadow debt. Right. Uh, Harley, I'm, I'm back now. Uh, I saw that article as well when I was uh, checking things out this morning. And you're absolutely correct. It's not $17 trillion. It's actually the uh, leverage debt that America is now under is closer to $2 quadrillion. It's impossible yeah, so, to pay it. Yeah, so it's impossible to pay it. So that if, it, if you think about Gross's figures where he says it's $1 GDP produced by $20 credit, but you realize that, as, as you just said, that we're really talking about a 50-fold increase in financial aggregates, that is derivatives, credit default swaps, and other kinds of debt obligations, it now requires $500 in financial aggregates for each $1 increase in GDP. Now, how can you sustain that? You can't. You'll yeah, never well. pay it. Now, here's an important point that I took out of that article this morning that I don't know if the other financial uh, experts have highlighted, but you've shown it this morning. What we have is a situation where even with the derivative uh, and the credit default swaps, what he's saying, basically, supernova, is it's reaching the point where even sucking all of the life out of the real economy and creating this bubble economy that you can't get any more profit out of it. In other words, there's no more juice in the lemons. Yeah, and that means that at some point you're going to have a worldwide currency war, which is happening now. We see the Venezuelization of Venezuela. They've literally frozen for a few months now the uh, supermarket prices. We see China in a currency war. Uh, we see basically Europe uh, still trying to charge their head on their, their quote, their carbon credit uh, garbage with the European Central Bank. And at the same time, Obama's charging forward saying he's going to fund every project imaginable, but it's not going to raise the debt. And uh, I really think that we're heading toward a bank holiday. I think that we're, I don't know if it's going to happen by the summer, but I know that top experts uh, have basically stated by the, not just the next week or so, when we hit the, the sequestration, which is really like pressing your thumbs on the carotid arteries of someone that cuts off the blood to their brain. The economy isn't going to take this shock well. And, and let me just add one point to that, which is that, as I was talking about earlier in the program, there are people who are smart enough among these financial elites 
to realize that the bailout process can't continue. Uh, just yeah. last week, there was a, a G20 summit of finance ministers in Moscow. Bernanke went there. Uh, the Europeans uh, uh, were there, and they were all saying, oh, don't worry, we can just produce more liquidity. They praised the Japanese for doing that. But even as they're doing this, that is, as the bubble is growing, and I don't know if you had a chance to see this, but I sent you something on another aspect of the bubble, which is the mergers and acquisitions uh, markets that are taking off. But even as these things are growing, there's a decision being made to pull the plug on this. And that's where we're going to see the genocide come in. And this is what right. Lyndon LaRouche talked about last Friday, that the decision has already been made to pull the plug which means your pension is going to be gone. Your savings will be gone. Your government will not have any money for your Social Security or your Medicare. Yeah, in fact, what All the government's trying to do is trying to seize $6 trillion of private pension funds and give you an IOU. You know that Obama's one of his next big moves is to seize everybody's pension funds and give them an IOU. Well, and at the same time, he's making uh, Medicare... Uh, a, a joke. I mean, I, you probably saw this, the story that after all the talk that the, one of the key points of Obamacare was to make sure that no one could be denied coverage because of a pre-existing condition, after they spent $5 billion to do that, they've cut it off. So now nine, I think it's, uh, what was the figure I saw? 90,000 people with pre-existing conditions were covered under this, but there are now 9 million more who will not be covered. So he just lied in pushing the program through. Right. So anyway, what LaRouche said is that as this bubble is popped, what we're going to see is a new financial system put together by the people who created the hyperinflation. They're right now buying assets. They're buying uh, raw materials. They're buying corporations like the H.J. Hines takeover. They're right. moving to get as much real value as possible. Yeah, but I saw that article you said, which is basically the uh, takeovers and mergers, the T&M, are basically a signs that the bubble is about to burst. Yeah, because every single time in the past when a bubble has burst, it's been preceded by a flurry of this kind of merger and acquisition activity. Because, right. number one, there's lots of money uh, available. Number two, the interest rates are low. The stock market uh, is favorable for this, and there's no regulation. And so you have money flowing into these things. Like H.J. Hines, the stock went up $15 overnight when the bailout was announced. And now the, the FBI is investigating uh, because there were 2,300 option puts. Did somebody know this in advance? Of course they knew it in advance. Amazing. The criminal system. Amazing. And the thing is, I believe that the, uh, the sound of the pop can almost be heard in advance of the event, probably this year. Welcome back and... Um the image in my mind uh, when I read that article this morning was the image after I saw the report last night by the uh, uh, late night TV host and uh, and uh, usurper in chief Obama. His image of uh, a president carrying a meat cleaver, literally two years ago in December, talking about uh, you know two years ago in 2010, talking about the sequestration. He wasn't going to give any wiggle room, and yet it's the White House's idea and his wackos behind him. And now he acts outraged, and how dare they do this, which is a meat cleaver to society, and it's going to kill jobs, etc. It's expected that in the military alone it'll kill 300,000 jobs. This will send a shockwave through the economy. Uh, this is not the way to build an economy or infrastructure. This is not the way to allow continued that sucking sound from the real economy into the speculative. Whereas you say with the supernova ratio that you talked about earlier, it's literally impossible not only to not make a profit anymore, even in the derivatives market, but to even support the world population. In fact, what I see happening is we have 2 billion people that are unemployed planetary-wide. 
that this is part of a global eugenicide program. And uh, no, no better report than that by Linda LaRouche in his latest newsletters that I read this morning on the LaRouchePAC.com website that this is basically eugenicide, and Obama well, is and what, participating in global eugenicide of billions of people. But Obama is a lying hypocrite, and right. you pointed out one example of that. Remember, he was going to be a transparent president, but he's the most he, secretive he, president we've ever had. Oh, it's Remember, unbelievable. he was going to close down Gitmo, he was going to end the wars, he was going to be fair, uh, and he's now gone to the point where his uh, CIA designate, uh, John Brennan, won't deny the fact that, that they might use drones to kill Americans in America. Now, I want to say one thing on that before we get back to the economy. It's, look, it's, it's shocking to say, for them to say they'll use drones to kill Americans in America. But the use of drones as a whole is a human rights violation. They are targeting locations. They're saying that these are, they're not killing civilians because if someone's in an area where there's a possible al-Qaeda suspect, then all the other people are potentially al-Qaeda terrorists as well. And this is why... Uh, you mean murder by association, if you're in the GPS That's coordinates right. of someone. So let's call it GPS-associated murder. So if you're in the GPS coordinates of a so-called target site... If you're site, in a quadrant, then you're obviously a sympathizer. Damn. And not only that, but they don't even have to prove that the person who you're supposedly a sympathizer with was actually Al-Qaeda. Right. So, in, in, other words, by, by, in other words, by psychic uh, intuition, you can target a specific coordinate. If someone happens to be in the coordinate, they're by association automatically guilty and therefore should be subdued. And as I say, they're going to be freed of the right for another pulse, a bright sunny morning, or the idea to have a breath or a hug. They're going to be removed from the mortal coil by a bunch of wacko maniacs that in any culture and any civilization in history, no one would even try to push this and say that it's reasonable and due process doesn't apply because after all we're at war right so what we have now is a culture that is so insane at the top in the district of criminals that in even in ancient cultures where people are having their brains eaten by gummitus syphilis they could not equal the evil of people like brennan and obama who sits and drools over these baseball cards of death on a tuesday now that's and that's where you see the, the genocide, the genocidal intent is something that's real. It's not something hypothetical. No, no. Alex Jones had a very interesting uh, whistleblower, and I, you know, what I call it the smell test. Alex did some very good work, and one of them was a whistleblower from Pendleton. When I can look out my patio window in my studio here in Vista, California, I can see Pendleton. And this whistleblower was a sniper who said he visited the Pendleton storage facility and said, why are you buying these billions of bullets? And he says, to keep it out of the market from civilians. It's not to confront civilians, because believe me, they're not going to do a military attack on civilians armed to the teeth already. It's not that they are even going to try to start knocking down doors. They're trying to make sure that the materials, like gun shows, etc., aren't available to let the public get more armed because of the horrendous things they're going to do to the economy and the population, like forced vaccination if there's a pandemic, or forced uh, martial law. Bank, I call a banking martial law, which is basically quite different than what people expect. We're talking about your credit cards don't work, your bank accounts are frozen. Uh, if you happen to be on specific lists, they can be permanently frozen. They're going to do selective, you know, late night acquisition of people they consider targets and remove them surgically from the communities. This is what yes, they're planning on doing. If you're a if you're a major international drug money launderer, <clears throat> or if you're a banker who provides a a free flow of cash to terrorists, you get a get out of jail free card. Right, or, or a free flow of class to congressmen and senators or private bank accounts for people like the president who bought a home uh, with his uh, relatively meager wages by comparison to corporate standards as a president who bought a 10, was it, 10 or $20 million home in Hawaii after three years. It's like, come on now, be realistic. that You didn't buy this home with your presidential salary. Well, I, I think the important thing to look at is that what Obama is committing now is genocide because the we're already seeing it with Obamacare we're seeing it with the threats the Bowles Simpson committee coming back out you know what what
what's lacking in all the discussion of the economy is how are we going to increase production? Obama says he's going to have an industrial revitalization. Doing what? Building windmills? Building solar panels that won't work? Uh, that can't plug into a grid? The, 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 we've seen the, the effects of the solar cars and the solar batteries that the U.S. government under Obama supported. They don't work. This is not an industrial recovery. Meanwhile, we just saw the effects of an unleashed planetary uh, danger from these near-Earth near Earth orbit objects like this meteor that hit. We well, let me give you a little spin on that as well, because I was yeah. head security clearance at U.S. Space Command. We have had, since the late 70s, early 80s, uh, directed energy weapons, Tesla weapons, that can take these objects and hit them with a plasma uh, accelerator, uh, you know, we want to call a particle beam, which Tesla developed and we acquired the technology and put it in space weapon platforms. This object that struck across the space and, and hit in, in near Chelyabinsk, Russia, and broke up into three major fragments, there's all the evidence that this object was coming in, but it was struck by a directed energy weapon, either from America or Russia. Uh, this wasn't just an incoming object, and one of the technologies has that we, we can use is use advanced technology to use space-based weapons to actually redirect asteroids as a weapon of mass destruction against our enemies. Well, and this is where the Russian proposal for strategic <clears throat> defense of Earth for collaboration on this is so crucial. You know, of I, course, I it's crucial because there was, there's countries like Russia and America that have the capacity to use asteroids as weapons against other populations to use weather modification to trigger off geotectonic events or superstorms and also rip uh, rents in the geomagnetic protection against ultraviolet light background solar and, and, and cosmic background radiation that can fry a population uh, people don't understand that we do have the what I call Buck Rogers in the 25th century technology right now because there's a split between tier 1 and tier 2 science we talk about this regularly with, with Professor McKinney the fact is that they do. There's no need for us to be worried about nearer space objects, but the problem is that they're going to use them. They literally have turned the Earth itself into a weapon of mass destruction. Well, and we've done it by precisely these budget cuts, which don't, which prevent the government from working in collaboration with Russia, with Italy, with Japan, with other countries that are doing this, and instead we're funding terrorists. Well, what they're doing is we have we have true fascism, which is the, the convergence of corporate and globalist desires, which transcend national boundaries and literally consume nations and just stretch the skins of nations over the superstructure that, of a and that's what corporate superstate. That's what LaRouche refers to as today's British Empire. Right, and today's British Empire is struggling to recreate a new empire of ghost or biometric money that the Bible calls the mark of the beast. And that mark of the beast system will come out of America. This bubble they're about to burst is to create a whole new financial system where you can't buy or sell, save you have the biometric opening or closing code. It's coming, because when they replay, when they blow up this system, the next one is not one you're gonna like. Well, unless we do something first. We have to, we have to, do an abomination, uh, abomination, Glass Steagall, state banks, uh, a proper uh, support of the Republic of America against the globalist uh, takeover, uh, and the removal of the corruption from the district or criminals. Well, that's quite a task, but we better get to work. If we don't do it, game over. No play, press, and reset. All right, talk to you next week. Amazing. Thank you, Harley, for covering the show and amazing reports coming up on Hour 3. We're going to have Barry Chomish. Stay tuned for Hour 2, our health and wellness.